you are exaggerating. How many bad Tudor dramas can there possibly be? Mm. Oh, that's not so much. Mm. So? The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, we shall be continuing our journey into the world of bad Tudor-related dramas, since, at this point, I am forever doomed to fight against them. The Tudors were always my friends in the past. Now, before I begin, a quick note about a certain broadcasting corporation, which happens to be British, and has never heard of fair use and or fair dealing. They don't seem to like me including clips in my videos, going so far as to claim one 28 second clip from Elizabeth R that I used in my last Tudor rant video, which was 40 minutes of me talking. Now, so far they have eventually dropped them, but I'm always worried that one of these days they might not be so merciful. And so I have decided that from now on in my Tudor rant videos, if I want to show a scene from a BBC drama that is longer than about 5 seconds, I will put up a screenshot and read out the quote. My apologies for this, but if said corporation bothered to look at things like context, or hell, actually read the big paragraph I write when I counter their claims, then I would not be doing this. I will still be using longer clips for the Six Wise review, and keep fighting those claims off, but I hope you can see why there is such a large gap between my proper movie reviews. And of course, make sure that you like the video and subscribe to my channel before you have even had a chance to formulate an opinion on my video, since every subscriber gets me closer to monetization, where I can potentially make a whole two pounds a month. We've got to have money. Now that is out of the way, onto the video. Usually, with these rants, I will look at multiple Tudor dramas, but today we will be looking at only one, and that is The White Princess. So in effect, this might as well be titled, A Review of the White Princess. The reason for this is that there was just so much wrong with this series, the usual 20 minute treatment would not do it justice. Now, if you have been watching my Tudor rants thus far, you'll be aware of my hatred of the Spanish Princess, which is a sequel to this White Princess series. I will say that its predecessors did not annoy me as much in the same way that being beheaded is more merciful than just being slowly hanged, but boy is this one bad. I also watched the entire thing somehow, so that will hopefully explain why I have a lot more stuff to cover. Since I have a lot to go through, I have decided to divide the video into various sections, namely story versus history, authenticity versus history, and a section looking at it as a drama on its own, and whether or not it works in spite of its historical flaws. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And then I'll finish with a conclusion. At this point, I'll mention that I have not read the books this series is based on, although I am aware that quite a few of these really bad plot points are taken from them, and then further confounded in that they are being adapted by people who don't seem to care about history anyway. Now you could say, well, this is historical fiction. To which I'll reply, fictional or no, if it claims to be set in the historical time period with historical characters, then it should be as faithful as it can. Otherwise, they might as well have written their own original fantasy story without taking the names of real life people. I enjoy plenty of other series that are historical fiction. For example, By the Sword Divided, which is set during the English Civil War and follows made up characters. But the series did a good job at showing what the era looked like, the brutality of the times, and was faithful to the historical events and authentic to the character and actions of the historical figures that appeared in the show. For me, the mark of a good historical fiction. And, by the way, I will be referring back to this point about what makes good historical fiction later on, so my apologies for banging on about it. So with that, and without any further ado, let us look at The White Princess. Now, if you're not familiar with this White Princess series, then I will give a brief rundown. The series starts just after the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, which saw Richard III, the last of the Yorkist kings, defeated at the hands of Henry Tudor, who took the throne as King Henry VII, and founded the Tudor dynasty. The series runs for about 14 years, from 1485 to 1499, and covers the troubled early years of the Tudor monarchy. Now, I say it covers the early years, but that would be a lie. It covers a few bits of it, but makes up a hell of a lot along the way. For example, literally within seconds of the start of episode 1, we are greeted with our first major inaccuracy. 
The episode tells us that Elizabeth of York, niece of King Richard III, is in love with him, and then shows a mixture of scenes of her sleeping with him intercut with his death. What the hell was that? I'm sure this will be explained in The White Queen, which I haven't yet seen, but Jesus H. Christ, what on earth is that all about? There is no way in hell Elizabeth of York, who I highly doubt knew Richard that well, would have an affair with him, not least since he deposed her brother from the throne. This whole thing seems to be based off of one rumour put out in 1485 that Richard was planning to marry Elizabeth. This was a smear against Richard, and according to the Croyland Chronicle, he denied it publicly. In fact, evidence suggests that he was planning to have Elizabeth married off to the future King Manuel I of Portugal, whilst Richard himself was going to marry Manuel's sister Joanna. Yes, the chronicle Edward Hall claims in his works that Richard was going to marry her, but he was writing several decades later, during the Tudor era, and yes, there is mention of one letter Elizabeth wrote claiming she wanted to marry Richard that the historian Sir George Buck, writing in the 17th century, claimed to have seen. However, the letter has been conveniently lost, and he never produced the full text of it. So you will excuse me, but I cannot take a non-existent letter seen by one historian in the 17th century as firm evidence. May I add as well that in both the Croyland and Hall's Chronicles, it is Richard pursuing Elizabeth, not the other way around. Seriously though, Philippa Gregory, why do you have so much incest in these things? First Anne and George Boleyn, and now Elizabeth and Richard? That article I reviewed wasn't lying when they said they were trying to make it like Game of Thrones. The butchery of history does not stop there. Not long afterwards, we find soldiers on their way to bring Elizabeth Woodville and her family to the Tower of London. And apparently Prince Richard, the younger of the two princes in the Tower, is still alive and hanging out with his mother. It is revealed that they apparently swapped him round and now here he is. Now, of course, in real life, we don't know exactly what happened to the princes, but it is safe to say that they died in the Tower. There is no convincing evidence that they escaped, and whilst we don't know for sure, they were not seen again after 1483. So what is this fantasy stuff with Richard being here? Yes, I know this is a historical fantasy novel. I just wish the historical parts were a bit more believable. It gets worse, though. Apparently, Elizabeth Woodville, mother of Elizabeth of York, is now a witch. Yes, that is right. She is practicing witchcraft and has put a curse on the Tudors. And if someone tells me, yeah, but people claim that at the time, I point out to you that magic is not real. I know she was a main character in the previous series, but by this stage she is really nothing politically. She probably did get involved too much after her daughter's on the throne and, in 1487, retired to Bourbonsey Abbey, where she lived out her days, although historically she was still welcome at court and even received ambassadors alongside Margaret Beaufort. While someone said she may have been involved in the Lambert Simnel Rebellion, the King doesn't seem to have thought this since he granted her various estates, which would be a bad thing to give to someone plotting against you. Not to mention that in 1488, well after the rebellion, he considered having Elizabeth Woodville married off to the King of Scots. Again, if she was plotting against you and was in confinement, why would you allow her to marry another monarch and leave the country where she would be free to plot and then have the Scots back her up? In 1490, he also granted her an annual pension of £400. Again, a funny thing to give someone you think is a traitor. Here, though, she seems to be fervently supporting all the plots and rebellions against Henry throughout most of the series. Oh, can I also just give you advice, my dear? If you write threatening letters, don't write them in your own blood, otherwise you'll end up looking like Sideshow Bob. Dear life in these United States, a funny thing happened to me. Oh. Use a pen, Sideshow Bob. We soon meet King Henry VII, who, whilst he's better than the Spanish princess Henry, is just written so poorly and feels more like a generic Disney villain at times as opposed to the cunning operator that Henry VII was. The real-life Henry was a man who turned a bankrupt and divided kingdom into a stable, prosperous and successful nation. We get a few hints here and there at this, such as Henry backdating his reign to the day before Bosworth, but other than that, nothing. He comes across as overly cruel, to the point that he basically rapes Elizabeth of York. By the way, I noticed that they declare she is pregnant before she married the king. Historically, they were married on the 18th of January 1486, and Prince Arthur was born eight months later, and is said to have been one month premature. So, if we do the maths, then that is highly unlikely that he was conceived until their wedding night, or just after. Sadly, though, this is just the beginning of the butchering of his character. 
Now, as you can imagine, being a new king during the Wars of the Roses means that you have a lower survival chance than the man getting open heart surgery performed with a sledgehammer. So the real-life Henry VII knew he had to marry Elizabeth of York in order to unite the warring houses of Lancaster and York, although he did not do so immediately since he wanted to prove that the crown was his by right of conquest. So he delayed the marriage to the point that Parliament had to petition him, thus make it look like it was his people's desire for the marriage and not his own. Not to mention that Richard III had previously declared Elizabeth illegitimate, so there was an act of parliament to revoke and titles to be restored. On top of that, he also had to send to Rome for papal dispensation, and I should note that it finally arrived in January of 1486, with Henry marrying her afterwards, suggesting that this was the main cause of delay. However, whilst some rumours to the contrary flew around, he always meant to marry her, since he had made that very promise before he left France so he could gain Yorkist support. In this series, however, he apparently knows about the made-up affair Elizabeth had with Richard and doesn't want to marry her at first, even I up the younger sister Cecily. Now, if the real Henry VII had gone and married someone else, all he would be doing would be leaving Elizabeth of York free to go and marry someone else and lay claim to his throne, strengthening his enemies. Not to mention some Yorkists would then switch over, since they had only sided with Henry since he promised to marry Elizabeth of York. I don't understand why they make him do silly things like this when the real-life Henry VII was positively Machiavellian and determined to show his own legitimacy to the crown. One way he did this was to go on a progress to the north, starting in March of 1486. When he got to York, there was an assassination attempt, but it was foiled, so it is said, by the Earl of Northumberland. Following this, Lovell, one of Richard III's old allies, tried to start a rebellion along with the Stafford brothers who, by the way, get mentioned in one throwaway line in this series and are then never mentioned again. Henry, though, was undeterred, and continued his progress to Gloucester and Bristol, the meagre rebel forces melting away before him. The rebellion thus came to nothing, and Henry returned to London, having displayed his power and secured the loyalty of these cities, with York, for example, refusing to support Lambert's Seminole rebellion the following year. The Henry and the White Princess, though, runs off back to London right after the assassination attempts. Compare this to James Maxwell's portrayal of Henry VII in the series The Shadow of the Tower, who says in that show, if we are ever to be safe anywhere in our country, we must be safe everywhere. Well, apparently not this Henry, since he looks like a coward. Henry also never really fought personally on the battlefield, since he wasn't a fantastic general by any means, and he knew this. Hence why he left the bulk of the commanding to his uncle Jasper and John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, the latter of whom I am now just realising isn't in this series at all. Whilst Henry held back, since he was the king and was important, the only time he ever came close to combat was at Bosworth, when Richard charged right at Henry's entourage, killing his standard bearer before Richard was cut down by Stanley's reinforcements. He does hold back at Stoke Field in this series, but in the other battles he is dismounted and right at the front. Now, of course, some kings were still leading from the front in this era, but many others did not since they were important and battles are rather deadly. Having Henry on the front line does not fit in with his historical character at all. This Henry's most uncunning act, though, has to be how he treats his mother when a certain secret is revealed. After it is revealed, he suddenly grabs her and quite literally slams her to the floor. What the hell? I felt like I was suddenly watching WWE wrestling for a moment. Even his more aggressive son, Henry VIII, never went that far. The closest to that would be him asking for a sword to be brought to him so he could kill Catherine Howard himself, but thankfully the council talked him out of it. Henry VII, who dearly loved his mother, would never have done this. Yes, there is a reason why he does it, and that is equally as stupid. So hold on to your Elizabethan pumpkin breeches for that one. Perhaps it is good at this point to move on to Elizabeth of York, the titular White Princess. Now, the historical Elizabeth is not so well documented compared to many other monarchs. We have very few of her letters, but there are still plenty of other sources we have at our disposal with which we can build a picture of how she was and how she felt about others in the court. We know that she was well loved by Henry VII, to point that, when Elizabeth died in 1503, it is said that Henry privily departed to a solitary place and would no man should resort unto him. The relationship may have been frosty at first, but considering that both Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville were plotting to have her marry Henry well before Bosworth, and that Henry had promised to do so as well before leaving France, he would certainly have had at least some sense of duty and honour towards her. Elizabeth was a dutiful wife and queen, and formed a strong impression on her second son, Prince Henry, the future Henry VIII, who it is believed wanted his own wife to resemble his mother's dutiful, obedient and pious ways. Elizabeth seems to have not gotten involved in politics too much, devoting herself to her children, and actually spent much of her time at Eltham Palace, away from the politicking of the court. 
As mentioned, her mother had plotted with Margaret Beaufort for the marriage in the first place, and Margaret was apparently liked well enough to be named as one of the godmothers of the York princesses. Lady Beaufort did insist on being treated higher up at official occasions at court as the Queen's mother, which could have caused some tension with Elizabeth of York, but protocol usually dictated that the mother of the monarch was ahead of the consort, and we have no surviving evidence to show Elizabeth's true feelings about the matter either way. Since she seems to have devoted herself to her mothering duties, it is probable she didn't think much of courtly ceremonies anyway. Overall then, we have a dutiful, noble and loving wife, who doesn't seem to have interfered with the day-to-day -day running of the country that much. Now, how about we throw all that history out of the window and have her some cat fights and period frocks, eh? Elizabeth of York in this series changes her motivations and personality more often than the Italians change sides in the 20th century. In the early episodes, she's sort of plotting with her mother, but then has cold feet, but then is plotting again, but then loves Henry, then doesn't love him, but then does again, is friends with Margaret Pohl, her cousin, then goes full on bitch mode about, about episode 7, briefly comes back, then goes up to 11 in her hatred of her. Her political influence is, even in the early episodes, quite powerful apparently, with her ordering the treasury doors broken down so they can dish out all the money to the people of London, who are dying of the sweating sickness. How a bit of money is going to save them all when they wouldn't be able to afford doctors, particularly since there was no cure for it, and even today we don't know what it is, I have no idea. Yes, she does say send out doctors and physicians, but again, I don't know how a couple of doctors are going to treat the whole of London. Still, she has successfully managed to further bankrupt the country just after a major civil war, although this is treated as a good thing by the king. You know, the one who historically raised taxes and jealously guarded his money. Granted, she was very charitable, but they make it like this is some sort of rebellious act. This Elizabeth is also more of a king than the king, who apparently has to rely on his wife to do just about everything. The most egregious example of this is during Perkin Warbeck's rebellion in late 1497, a bit more on that event later on. Before the decisive battle, a load of Henry's nobles desert, but Elizabeth, who historically was nowhere near the battlefield, rides out and single-handedly convinces the deserting noblemen to support Henry against Warbeck, who were abandoning the king they'd swore allegiance to because he hadn't yet arranged an alliance with Spain. Okay, ignoring the fact that the Spanish don't have the technology to quickly muster and then fast travel their army to England in time for a battle that was nothing to do with them, why on earth would the noblemen even need convincing? And why does the Queen have to do it? They are loyal to the King first and foremost. They swore their oaths to him. Many of the historical commanders, like Oxford and Lord Daltony, were his trusted friends, and Henry had won his crown in battle, and deliberately put off marrying Elizabeth so he could show the country that it was his crown by right of battle, not by right of marriage. Granted, you may have had a few Stanley-esque waverers in there, but then, in this historical situation, Warbeck had no chance. Instead, we have a weak Henry, who commands about as much authority as one Mr. A. Hilton in his bunker, whilst his wife, who should be caring for their children, is basically saving his backside all the time. You don't need to make up stuff to have Elizabeth be badass. It is perfectly fine to have a character who is loyal and stays at home. Not every person in this era was Joan of Arc on steroids. And now on to the character of Lady Margaret Beaufort, the King's mother. Before I begin, can I just ask, what the hell did Margaret do to Philippa Gregory? Did she kill her sainted aunt or something? The real-life Margaret Beaufort, whilst a cunning and formidable woman, was not some sort of Cersei Lannister wannabe. Historically, while she did have some influence over appointments at court and did advise her son, she devoted most of her time to fixing church roofs and overseeing religious matters, not plotting and scheming. Now, what do we know about her? Well, she was certainly determined and had some influence, insisting on being put ahead of the Queen and being well-dressed, although, as I mentioned, that was usually the protocol, and Elizabeth of York seemed to be distant from the politics. Margaret, meanwhile, appears to have been quite kind to Elizabeth, providing rooms for her to stay in after Bosworth, and allowing her a place in which to meet with her future husband. May I also add that Margaret defended Elizabeth's younger sister Cecily when she went and married a commoner, even providing rooms for her as well, and directly defending her and her husband in front of the king. Hardly the actress of a cold-hearted Rasputin-like figure. This power behind the throne stick, though, is everywhere. Seriously, she's even sitting on the king's privy council. No, she would not be sitting there, nor would Elizabeth for that matter. The privy council was the king's council. It was there to advise him and was made up of noblemen and other important figures who held governmental positions, like the Lord Chancellor, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and so on. The Queen's mother and the Queen would not be sitting on his council. It would be like having the old Queen Mother attending meetings of the Cabinet. 
Yes, but she's been dead for nearly 20 years, I hear you say. Well, don't worry, this series wouldn't mind that at all. Hell, they would probably have her being behind every single political event since the Iraq War if they ever wrote a show like that. And that leads me on to one of the worst parts of this series, the revelation that Margaret Beaufort killed the princes in the tower. Yes, you heard that right. Margaret Beaufort in this universe murdered the princes in the tower. <sighs> yes, I know the ultimate fate of the princes is unknown, but of all the people, of all the suspects, you went for Margaret Beaufort. How on earth would she even have the opportunity to do so? It is implied that she killed them during Richard III's reign. How the hell would she even get into the tower to commit the act? Oh boy, I can't wait to see how the White Queen explains that plot point. Well, they can't make this any worse, I hear you say. Oh no, dear viewer, they can. Remember Henry's uncle Jasper? You know, the one that commanded his armies and was a close advisor to the king and also a friend of Margaret Beaufort? Well, he finds out about the princess and is going to tell the king, so Margaret smothers him to death. I, I, I honestly was shocked when this happened, and I knew it was coming. One commenter on my last rant video told me about this, and whilst I believed them, deep down I thought, no, 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 they, they must be mistaken. Surely they wouldn't stoop that low. Well, they did. The saintly Margaret Beaufort, who fixed church roofs, murdering her own brother-in-law. It might as well be a metaphor of the series when we was confronted by historical facts. Just smothered them to death. And now we also have the character of Perkin Warbeck. Sorry, Richard Duke of York. Yes, as I mentioned about earlier, he has survived in this series. While some of the real-life story of Warbeck is unclear, we do know that he was Flemish and was hired by a Breton merchant who took him to Ireland, since he wanted to see the world, as it were. However, when he was in Cork in around 1491, some Yorkists saw him dressed up in fine silk and thought he resembled one of Edward IV's children, and so a plot was hatched, that he would pretend to be Richard, the younger of the princes in the tower, and claim the throne. He would spend the next several years floating around Europe looking for support, gaining at various times friends in France, Burgundy and the Empire. He made his first attempt at the crown in 1495, landing at Deal in Kent, with 1500 mercenaries hired from Burgundy. But the whole enterprise was a disaster, with his force being beaten off by the local equivalent of the militia. He then went to Ireland and attempted to besiege Waterford, but failed as well. Now none of this, save for his foreign support, is mentioned at all in the Miss White Princess series, and is portrayed as a noble figure and the rightful king, whereas the real-life Warbeck was rather incompetent at military affairs, to put it politely, and was more of a pawn for dissident Yorkist exiles. When we finally do get to the real story, it only bears a superficial resemblance to what happened. The real-life events went something like this. In 1496, Warbeck had gone to Scotland and enlisted the help of King James IV, who pushed south with an army, forcing Henry VII to raise forces and call a parliament to levy taxes to fund it. The Scots advanced in September, but their army made very little headway and fell back once they heard of an approaching force led by Ralph Lord Neville. Soon the Scots made peace and King James IV abandoned his support for Warbeck, who was then more or less forced to leave by James. However, Henry VII's troubles were not over. The people of Cornwall resented having to fund a war at the other end of the country, and revolted, marching towards London and amassed an army of anywhere between 10 and 17,000 men. The king was forced to march with his own army, led by Giles Lord Daubney, to crush the rebels, which he did with relative ease at the Battle of Blackheath in June 1497. In September, Warbeck landed in Cornwall with a mere 120 men, proclaiming that he would undo the king's taxes, and was able to gather 6,000 Cornishmen to his side. The king dispatched Lord Daubney to crush this latest rebellion, but as soon as his scouts approached the rebels, Warbeck panicked and fled, and much of his army melted away without a battle, with the rest later surrendering to the king at Taunton. Warbeck fled and was captured at Bolio Abbey. Now this series decided to do it really backwards. The basics are there at first. The Scots move south, before back without a fight, although for whatever reason the king himself is here again. However, they make out that the real reason why the Scots army retreats is that Warbeck is going to visit his newborn son, I... what? Yes, he was married to Lady Catherine Gordon, but there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that they had children. Why did you make that up? Well, other than to have Margaret Beaufort murder yet more children. Anyway, moving back to the story. The Battle of Blackheath is actually barely mentioned. All we get is one shot of some people protesting taxes with as much enthusiasm as Father Ted. Down with this sort of thing! Careful now. Down with this sort of thing! This really irks me, since my father is Cornish, and this rebellion was a major event in Cornish history, with over 10,000 men led by predominantly lawyers and men of low birth, managing to get to the very outskirts of London being quite an accomplishment, even if they did utterly fail. 
yet it is basically glossed over in this series. In reality, there was a battle at Blackheath. Not a bloody one, mind you, with the poorly led rebel army being easily defeated and losing only 200 men and no more than a few dozen of the kings, but it was a fight nonetheless. The Shadow of the Tower portrayed this correctly, so why did it this series? They then do have Warback land and raise his army, but whereas the Second Cornish Rebellion petered out without a fight, the White Princess does depict a major battle happening. Oh, and for some reason Henry's noblemen are reluctant to fight for him, as previously mentioned. Why did they have to take this really backwards look at Warbeck's various attempts at the throne? The real-life Warbeck fled, but this one is suddenly all noble and has a son as well. Considering his reputation of failed rebellions and sieges, the real-life Warbeck comes across as something of a pitiful figure, but this one is so convinced of his legitimacy that he constantly goes out of his way to get Henry to abdicate, even right to his face. Now, the real-life Henry was merciful, and after Warbeck had confessed to being an imposter, he did allow him to stay at court. They do sort of show this, but they literally have him shuffling dung. The real-life Warbeck eventually tried to escape and was sent back to the tower. At this point, it is believed that the Spanish would not agree to marry Catherine of Aragon to Prince Arthur, Henry's son, until Warbeck and the Earl of Warwick were dead. Warbeck and Warwick tried to escape from the tower. Whether this was actually planned by them or secretly encouraged by the king so he could have a reason to execute them, we do not know. Warbeck was hanged at Tyburn and Warwick beheaded on Tower Hill. This series, though, forgets the whole escaping thing, a hazard that Elizabeth of York actually believes he is her brother and tries to save him. I really don't have much else to say about this. Whilst it might make an interesting fantasy what-if scenario to have Warwick be the actual rich Duke of York, it barely fits in with the history. The real-life Warbeck was quite pitiful, if I'm being honest, a pawn in the game of the Yorkists who desperately wanted rid of Henry. He was a useless commander, and every attempt he made at the crown failed miserably. Moving on from the main characters, the series also does this weird thing where the actions and achievements of quite important figures are dumbed down, and in some cases completely forgotten, whilst other characters, mainly Elizabeth of York and Margaret Beaufort, do things that they did not, could not, and would not have done. The main example I will be using here is of John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln. Now, blink and you will miss him in this series. He's at Henry's court in the first episode, after having fought for King Richard, where Henry pardons him in a rather snarky fashion. He doesn't pop up again until episode 4, when they're parading Warwick around. In the show, they make out this is a big mistake, since the people start chanting their support for him. In reality, this was a very clever move by Henry, since it showed to the world that he hadn't murdered him in the tower, like with what Richard may or may not have done with his nephews, which reduced the legitimacy of Lambert Simnel over in Burgundy, who was pretending to be the Earl of Warwick. What really annoys me though is that, out of nowhere, Lincoln draws his sword, shouts that he's loyal to Warwick and the House of York, kills a few guards, and then dashes off somehow, managing to evade all those guards. Compare that to the Shadow of the Tower, where his story is given the time it deserves. He was a nephew of Rich III, and it was rumoured he was to be his successor. After Bosworth, though, Henry pardoned him. Things started to go sour, though. He felt dissatisfied with his place, since he had a lot of influence during the reign of King Richard, which was now gone. When the Lambert Simnel Rebellion happened, he secretly left England and travelled to Burgundy to proclaim his support for the Pretender, although he himself had a decent claim on the throne, and it has been suggested that, had the Yorkist forces triumphed, he may have taken the crown for himself. He was the main lead of Lambert's army at the Battle of Stoke Field, and died there. That, to me, is an interesting story to tell, but no. He gets three scenes, basically. His pardon, his defection, and his death. What do we get in place of this interesting story? Margaret of Burgundy. Yes, that is right, Margaret of Burgundy, the sister of Richard III, who historically funded the rebellion and helped provide the German mercenaries, not Flemish, by the way, has decided, you know what, sod my country of Burgundy, I'm going to personally go to England and watch the battle with two guards. It goes without saying that she did not command it since she was busy in Burgundy and had never led an army in her life. Not to mention that she somehow manages to escape and get back to Burgundy in record time. The Battle of Stoke Field itself is about as accurate as the Battle of Stirling Bridge in Braveheart. Granted, a lot of details of the battle are unknown, but we do know that Lincoln, the actual commander, wanted battle and advanced with his forces, fighting Henry's vanguard led by the Earl of Oxford. The battle raged for three hours until the King's main body arrived and drove back the exhausted Yorkists. This version of it might as well be known as the Twelfth Battle of the Generic Medieval Fantasy Part 1. Not as bad as the Battle of Slomo Bodsworth would, but it's still pretty bad. What baffles me with this series is that they basically gloss over and forget other really interesting things that happened during this time period that could have been character building in favour of daft plots about witchcraft, curses and Margaret baby killer Beaufort. 
For example, in 1488, the Duke of Brittany, who had shielded Henry VII when he was in exile before he took the crown, died, leaving his 11-year-old daughter Anne as his successor. In 1490, she was married by proxy to the Holy Roman Emperor, the arch enemy of King Charles VIII of France, who then invaded Brittany the following year in order to marry Anne and effectively annex the duchy. This presented Henry with a problem. On the one hand, he owed the Bretons for sheltering him, he had promised to protect them, and if France annexed Brittany, then they would have even more coastline opposite England, which could present a problem in case of a future war with France. On the other hand, Henry owed his crown to the French, it was the King of France who provided him with mercenaries and money with which he won the throne. Also, a lot of trade depended on France, and a war with them would disrupt that, which would be a major problem since the country was already in financial straits following the Wars of the Roses and the suppression of the Lambert Simnel Revolt. His solution, though, was one fitting his Machiavellian character. He did support the Bretons, with some half-hearted expeditions that failed, and a siege of Boulogne in 1492, which, as you can see, is nowhere near Brittany. Now, at first glance, this may seem a disaster, and the siege of Boulogne a waste of time, but it produced results. The King of France was now embroiled in the Italian wars, and, not wanting a war on two fronts, signed a peace treaty with England, agreeing to pay a large sum of money and also end French support for Warbeck. The siege of Boulogne began after the negotiations started, and was merely a threat to make Charles give in. Henry did not have much hope of saving Brittany, and it could be argued he deliberately let them fail. Not that English support were to save them anyway, but his actions meant that he, firstly, kept his honour somewhat, since it looked like he had held them, and secondly, secured his finances, since the sum the French gave him was more than enough to cover the war, and he kept Parliament in session to raise more taxes for a non-existent campaign. He had also secured trade with the French, and, as a part of the treaty, they ended their support for any pretenders to the Crown, as previously mentioned. If this does not show just how Henry VII was a shrewd genius, then I don't know what else will. Now imagine if we had an episode devoted to that, looking at Henry pondering over what he should do, conflicted over his loyalties to both the Bretons and the French, and coming up with a solution. Not to mention you could definitely feature some fighting in there with the French invasion of Brittany and the siege of Boulogne, and weigh up the moral and political ramifications of what he did. There could also be a discussion about whether it was a success overall, since many of his more war-happy nobles were left dissatisfied, and the French gained their territory. So, White Princess. Do you want this major historical event oozing with drama that was gift wrapped for you? Nah, more witchcraft curses and incest, please. We do get a bit of foreign policy within the negotiations for the marriage between Arthur, Prince of Wales, and Princess Catherine of Aragon. Even then, though, they managed to mess that up. Firstly, they claim that all of Europe is supporting Warbeck, which, whilst he did have support at various times, I would hardly say all of Europe. I can't imagine the Pope, who had given his support in the past to Henry, would be backing Warbeck. Secondly, they claim that they should be making an alliance with Spain since they were the only ones not to go to Warbeck's wedding, and are thus the only country not supporting him. May I remind you of that bit after the war with France where Charles VIII agreed to stop supporting him? May I also humbly point out that Arthur and Catherine were betrothed as early as 1489 with the Treaty of Medina del Campo? Now, of course, it wasn't until 1497 that things really started moving, which is what this is showing, but hey, at least we will see Henry sending his ambassadors to negotiate this important... We will not leave it to a letter. We will go there in person. Why? Why are you going to Spain yourself? You don't need to do that, even if it is important. Just send ambassadors. That is their job. It would take months of arduous travelling across rough seas and a long journey right across Spain. Oh, and in this series, when Henry and Elizabeth get there, what happens? They have one conversation with Ferdinand and Isabel. Well, what the hell do they do to Isabel of Castile? She's only in the mid-40s at this point. I don't think she was dressed up like the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. A anyway, sorry. They travel all that distance to have one conversation. Or rather, Elizabeth has a conversation with Isabella, since their husbands are either too stupid or too comatose to understand anything. And then they go home. All that effort, travelling and so on for one chat, when you could have just sent someone in your stead. Well, it could be worse. It's not like they left the country knowing that Perkin Warbeck was banning to invade. And when the wedding feast is done, Whoever he may be, he wants my kingdom. Oh, okay, well, at least he didn't invade when they were gone. And he invaded while they were gone. Well done. This is definitely how the real-life Henry VII would have done it. The whole plan was positively Bismarckian in his execution. Now, in real life, Henry sent ambassadors to negotiate the marriage since, firstly, that's the point of having an ambassador. That is why we have them now, since the person leading the country can't be in a hundred nations at once. And secondly, he was busy dealing with Warbeck. 
I don't know why they had to go to Spain. I mean, if he was so desperate to have a scene filmed there, just have a scene with the ambassador going there and having a meeting with Ferdinand and Isabella. Well, at least we do get a look at the Spanish court while we're there. Or we get a really weird and stupid dancing scene with young Catherine of Aragon. <sighs> Tell me, writers, did you forget that Spain is a real country and thought it was some sort of mythical land somewhere between Narnia and Ruritania? Now, if you thought the film Cromwell had a problem with necromancy, just wait till you see this series. There are several characters that are alive many years after their historical deaths. The worst one has to be Mary, Duchess of Burgundy, who died in 1482, three years before the series even starts, and five years before she dies in the series. Why do they bother adding her? Why on earth do they do that? Well, apparently, it was so they could blame Jasper Tudor and Lord Strange, Henry's ambassadors, for her death. <sighs> the thing is, this really does mess up with the history, since, historically, the death of Mary signalled the effective end of Burgundy, as the French then took over a lot of land, and the reduced duchy was then left with the Low Countries. Margaret was, by 1488, left as regent in the stead of Philip, whilst Mary's widow went back to be Holy Roman Emperor. Philip's son, Charles, would eventually become emperor himself and inherit the whole lot, which then became part of the wider Habsburg Empire. You could have stuck to the history and had her already as a regent, or soon to be regent, of a reduced duchy of Burgundy, instead of mucking up the timeline just to add a silly plot point blaming the death of Mary on Lord Strange. Can I just mention as well, I don't think there is any reference to the French taking over half of Burgundy, save for a talk of an invasion and a throwaway line. Then we have Cecily Neville, the grandmother of Elizabeth of York on her father's side, being alive in 1499, four years after her death. And we don't see her die either, so hell, she's probably still out there right now. You just can't wait for me to die, can you? Elizabeth Woodville as well lingers on for five or so years or more after her death. I really don't get this. They prolong the lifespan of these characters and get them involved in events they did not and probably would not have been involved in, if we were being faithful to the history, of course, whilst completely write out the actual important people like the Earl of Lincoln, Lovell, uh, uh, oh no wait, sorry, Emma Frost already told us that there is no such thing as historical truth and the history we have is not what happened. So I guess we will just go with zombie Elizabeth Woodville casting spells on Henry VII. I'll say this though, that it does present the timeline slightly better than the Spanish princess but it messes with it so much and adds loads of unnecessary plot points while sacrificing quite interesting historical ones, I do have to ask... What the fuck? Who wrote this stupid shit? None of this makes any sense, and what does make sense is fucking cringe. Now, I wasn't quite sure what to title this section, since authenticity might be a little vague. But basically, what I will be dealing with in this section is how the characters appear compared to their historical counterparts. The accuracy of the costumes, the accuracy of the scenery, and the general accuracy of things like the language used, ceremonies, and so on. We're going to start with the military stuff. I'm afraid I'm no Lindy Bage or Shadowversity when it comes to late medieval armour and weapons, but I will give it a shot. Also, I would advise you to watch my quick rant video about Bosworth before proceeding. Link below. Now, some of the armour used isn't too bad. The knights and so on look okay for the late 15th century. It is the soldiers, though, that I do have to moan about. We have no halberds or bill hooks, despite these being the most common weapons used, and no livery, save for some Tudor badges, although, granted, Henry historically was trying to get rid of the livery. What annoys me, though, are, yet again, the shields. They did not have the 13th century looking things by the late 15th century. In fact, shields had virtually disappeared from the battlefield, save for some smaller things like bucklers and some large shields like pavises. The only other shields I could find evidence of were these gun shields, used by Henry VIII's bodyguards during his 1513 campaign, and, as you can see, they are smaller and of a completely different style. Not to mention they are pretty much unique to the king's bodyguards in the 1513 campaign. You could have saved a load of money on the budget by not making these crusader shields, you know. As mentioned, the soldiers would be carrying billhooks and halberds, with some men having pikes, so they would not be able to wield giant shields like this and double-handed weapons at once. Well, I mean, they could try, but it would be a little less manoeuvrable, I imagine. Not to mention that many of them are wearing armour, so they are protected. Another thing as well, remember back in the Hundred Years' War that the longbow was kind of the most dominant and famous weapon used by the English? Well, it was still very dominant in England's armies, and most forces would usually have had a very large force of them. Sometimes almost two-thirds of the entire army would be longbowmen. Yet there seems to be barely any archers, although at least we do see some arrows at Stoke Field, which means you're doing better than Bosworth. Speaking of Stoke, I have to mention battle tactics as well, or lack thereof. Historically, armies would usually be split into three parts. 
the vanguard, which was the front line, the main guard, which was the centre, and the rear ward, or reserve. This was important to Stoke, since the Earl of Lincoln committed his army forward and engaged Oxford and the van. After nearly three hours, just when it looked like Oxford would be pushed back, the main guard and the rear ward arrived, driving back the Yorkists. In this version of Stokefield, I see very little attempt at any sort of formation, and they all just generally mosh around. Hell, they even have ten-year-old Lambert Simler on the front line fighting! Christ, he's ten! Even in this era, a ten-year-old would not be expected to lead from the front! The closest thing we get to formations is some weird shield wall thing Henry does with half a dozen men when fighting Warbeck. Please see my previous point though about shields to see why this tactic would not exist. Moving on from the military, let us look at the court. Much like the Spanish princess, the costumes are pretty dire. Occasionally you'll see one or two good bits here and there, like Henry finally wearing a period appropriate hat, but the costumes are generally inaccurate, particularly the ladies ones. I will redirect you to Frockflix, who have written in some length about how bad this show and the Spanish Princess is on early Tudor fashion. But briefly, the ladies, much like in the sequel, are lacking hoods, despite the fact that in this era it was pretty much expected of a noble lady to wear some sort of hood or hat. Elizabeth of York is very famous for wearing the English hood, to the point that it is what the Queen and Deck of Cards is based off of. She does not wear a single hood in this entire show, though. Her dresses are terrible as well. I mean, look at this. She's practically flashing her. Um, duckies off. Now I'm sure if you dug around you could find examples of one or two controversial women in this time period exposing themselves like this, but remember this is a highly Christian era where modesty was emphasised. Would you really expect the Queen of England to go around walking like this? Aha, I hear you say. There are some costumes in that Shadow of the Tower series that are inaccurate. Yes, some are. Most, however, are accurate, and they clearly tried, whereas in this series, they did not. For example, the few women who do wear hoods are quite often wearing ones that are years away, like French hoods, which did not become common until Henry VIII's time. I don't understand. Why can't you just try and make it look like the originals? It's not like there are no existing original portraits or manuscripts to draw from. I'm not saying you have to make a carbon copy of the costumes from portraits, but you could at least make them look like them in terms of style, and still make them in different colours, or with a slightly different cut or whatever, to give your costume designers some freedom. And don't go and tell me it is because of the budget. The Six Wives series had a way lower budget back in 1970, to the point that, according to Glenda Jackson, who was in the Elizabeth R sequel, they were spray painting coffee cups. However, the makers of that series went to the galleries, the museums, and the castles to look at these original portraits. I will link an interview below with the costume designer John Bloomfield. He actually took a whole year to research and make the costumes for the Henry VIII series, by the way. Male costumes are a bit dire as well. I mean, why are these servants in Burgundy wearing the coat of arms of Scotland? This is the coat of arms of Burgundy. The closest thing to this would be the Red Lion of Holland, but they're in Flanders. The sets are also not that great. A lot of them are the exact ones used in the Spanish Princess, so I have already gone into a bit of detail about them in the previous rant. Although I will give them some credit in that they were consistent and that they are at least meant to be the same building, so well done. That does not excuse basic errors though. The most egregious one in my mind is all the blue banners with white roses hanging up in York when Henry VII visits there. Guess what the white rose is a symbol of? Oh yeah, the House of York, not the city itself. The coat of arms of York are based off of the cross of St George, with the lions representing its loyalty to the king, and has been in use since at least the reign of King Edward III. Why on earth, then, would they be flying the symbol of the dynasty that Henry VII deposed? It would be like Oliver Cromwell decorating his house with royalist standards. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought the Yorkist banner was usually blue and red with the white rose or the son of York. The all blue flag with the white rose is the modern day flag of Yorkshire that was introduced in the 1960s and didn't become the official flag until 2008. In all honesty though, if the king is visiting, wouldn't you want to display his flag and arms, not the symbol of either the dynasty he fought against or of your county about half a millennia into the future? Also, something I did not notice until just before I recorded this, but when Henry first arrives in London following Bosworth, Richard's boar with the white rose is still hanging up but right above the king. Did no one think to tear that down before the king held court? When the regime collapses, usually you will see the old symbols get torn down. Not here in the white princess, it seems. A bit nitpicky as well, but did Tudor gardens really look like this? I see a lot more well-kept hedges and flowers when I see recreations of these things. And now on to language. 
By the way, I am really saddened that this series did not have any lice-ridden, filthy actors speaking exclusively in Middle English, since of course if those elements are not present, that will automatically make it a bad drama in my eyes. Now when I say language, unlike what the writers think, I am not talking about whether or not they are speaking in the period-appropriate language. I have seen plenty of dramas where the characters speak normal English, since that is a necessary sacrifice so people can understand what the actors are saying. What I want when I see a drama is if the style of language used is correct and makes it feel like it is somewhat in the time period. You only have to read the works of Shakespeare or even just a few letters from the Tudor era to see how people talked and addressed each other and the phrases and metaphors they used. For example, The Shadow of the Tower has one of my favourite lines when Archbishop Morton is talking to Richard Fox about Richard Simmons, one of the people behind the Lambert Simler Rebellion, who they have just captured. Fox asks Morton, how far has this gone, my lord? Referring to the plans for the rebellion. To which Morton replies, When the frog croaks, my dear fox, do not imagine that they alone inhabit the pond. The pike, below the waterline, silent unseen, is far more dangerous and harder to catch. I think that is a wonderful line. And notice that he calls him, my dear fox. The reverence in many of the lines in that show made it feel period appropriate. The language in the White Princess, meanwhile, lacks all reverence. Even when we look at the monarchy today, we still see a lot of formality and respect that has transcended the ages. Ladies and gentlemen, having on so many occasions been welcomed to opening ceremonies around the Commonwealth, it is a pleasure this time to welcome you to my own home. Now, of course, it wasn't exactly like this in Tudor times, but this reverence and formality was apparent at every level. If the king was receiving someone, he would be expected to act gracefully, even if he were having a go at them. Just read his letters to the Duke of Burgundy. Of course, insults could be traded, but they'd always be worded very politely, in much the same way that members of Parliament today will still call their opponents my right honourable friend, even when disagreeing with them. Now, I expect you're wondering just how King Henry VII behaves in front of his court. Well... She has had her trading licences revoked, so you should shut your mouth! Truly magnificent and awe-inspiring responses from the king there. Shakespeare must be turning in his grave since his works cannot compare to the wondrous usage of phrases such as shut your mouth, spoken with the drawl of a man who's had a few too many drinks down the pub. We also see the women of the court acting in ways that would not be expected of them. Elizabeth seems to be able to just wander about at will, plotting and scheming. The real life Elizabeth was not like this at all, I would usually partake in giving out charity, which, yes, yeah, she does in one episode, but they make it out as a rebellious act, not a common thing, as I discussed in the last section. Really though, the problem applies to the entire court. There was a strict hierarchy and strict rules as to what people would do, so the Queen would usually go off and do needlework, dancing lessons, give out money to the poor and needy, and generally be the kind face of the monarchy, with her ladies-in-waiting, who, by the way, are absent in quite a few scenes of this show. Whilst the King would usually be busy running the affairs of the country, meeting ambassadors, attending the Privy Council, and so on. Here though, it feels like everyone is running around plotting and scheming with no sense of reverence and awe that we'd usually expect in a place such as the early Tudor court. Now I apologise once again for bringing up the Princess Principal anime, but they at least understood that the character of Princess Charlotte is meant to be a princess. So in that series, her life revolves around dancing, music, horseback riding, learning languages, attending formal receptions, and so on. Yeah, but princesses don't go spying. Well, usually they don't, but remember, this one is a fictional Cold War-esque world in a steampunk universe, and in the show she wants to be queen and become a spy for the other side so they can put her on the throne, so she's merely doing that to achieve her goal. At least she is discreet about it and still acts like a princess publicly. Meanwhile, in The White Princess, we have nothing but angst, very little formality, a writer that would be more suited to a soap drama. Hell, even the princess principal Charlotte can be polite when she's actually chastising others. Princess? And the nicknames in The White Princess. Oh my god, the nicknames. I know I mentioned this in The Spanish Princess, but they were even more insufferable in this one. At least Harry, Charlie, Meg, etc. makes sense. They're even more off here. I mean, why is Edward Earl of Warwick called Teddy? Was that even a nickname back then? It's not like there are an overabundance of Edwards in this one. Now, some of you will be saying, Oh, come on now, you were just nitpicking. You would never do this to those older Tudor dramas you love so much. Well, I will direct you to my series reviewing the 1976 Wives series, but okay, I'll tell you what. I will nitpick a scene from one of the old ones, and then compare it to the White Princess. 
So this scene is from the 1972 film Henry VIII and the Six Wives, and is meant to be shown in the execution of Catherine Howard, the soon-to-be former fifth wife of Henry VIII. First error, there is a Victorian-looking lamppost in the background. Second error, whilst we don't know exactly what Catherine wore that day, we know it was February, and that Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, mentioned that her body was wrapped up in her cloak after the execution, so she should be wearing a cloak of some sort, which was probably black in colour, and it is reasonable to suggest that she would probably be in a thicker black dress, not a flimsy white and blue kirtle, or whatever it is she is wearing. The guards as well look a bit over-armoured. They would probably be wearing something like this in real life. Catherine also doesn't say a word in this. She just walks onto the scaffold, gives the executioner a tip, is then blindfolded, and places her head on the block. In reality, she did give a speech where, according to the merchant and eyewitness, Oddwell Johnson, she uttered her lively faith in the blood of Christ only, desired all Christian people to take regard unto her worthy and just punishment, saying also that she had offended God heinously from her youth upwards in breaking all his commandments, and had offended against the king's royal majesty very dangerously, and urged the people to take example and obey the king in all things. The location is meant to be within the tower, but it was actually filmed at Eton College, and the chapel building here doesn't look anything like the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. Finally, there are barely any people present. In reality, whilst it was a private execution, a few members of the Privy Council and some other local officials like Johnson would be there to observe, although, to be fair, they may be standing off screen, since the camera only points this way, and one promotional picture used on the poster does appear to show some people watching. Now, as you can see, that one scene is not perfect, but despite of that, it still feels Tudor. The costumes, even if they are not the exact ones worn that day, are pretty period appropriate. Not only that, but it does get a few of the conventions in there, such as the victim tipping the executioner. Some of the other errors I can also understand. The film was barely two hours long, and covered the whole of Henry's reign, so they could not fit everything in, and often had to condense events, hence why she doesn't give a last speech. I think it may also have been done for dramatic reasons, since you have to basically go off of her facial expressions. Alan Frederick did a great job of showing Catherine's fear of what was about to happen, while she tries to stay composed. Now we shall compare it to this execution scene in The White Princess of Sir William Stanley. Firstly, whilst this is a somewhat better looking set compared to the Six Wives film, it is still off, but most importantly, he was not executed inside the tower. He had a public execution on Tower Hill, outside of it. Now, whilst there are some officials here to report to the king, there's really no need since the king is here watching and has brought the family along. Now, whilst your average peasant may bring his family to watch somebody getting beheaded, the king would not. He's busy running the country and certainly would not bring his children along to watch this. This is the Tudor era, not Game of Thrones. Then he actually does give a speech, but I wish he had just stayed quiet because he says, Before I die, you are not a king, nor fit to be one. England rots beneath you. Men weep. So kill me, and you will kill many others after me. Men who will line up to say, Long live the true, able king, Richard. This just flies in the face of history. There was something of a macabre formality with the person's last speech. They would usually proclaim how guilty they were, or, at the very least, how just the king is, like what Catherine did at her execution. They would not openly state, down with the king, since that would then endanger their family. If a nobleman said that, then the king may well decide to punish any remaining family that may have had, in retaliation for bad-mouthing him on the scaffold. And, by the way, Stanley did have a wife and children, and even though their estates were confiscated, would you take the risk of leaving your family destitute just to slag off the king? Could you imagine if Catherine Howard, who would probably have known that several of her family were imprisoned in the tower, including her own grandmother, started saying how terrible Henry VIII was? Knowing Henry, he may well have flown to a rage and killed them all. Then Stanley doesn't tip the executioner, which, whilst I expect wasn't always the case, was usually a formality, since the person being executed knew that, if the executioner missed a stroke, then the execution could be painful, as happened with Mary Queen of Scots in spite of the tip. So it was quite common to tip them to make sure they did a good job. Then he is forced down, which, unless the person was hysterical, they would not do. I will say, at least in this one scene, the costumes the people on the scaffold are wearing are at least not too bad. Can you see the difference? One scene, even with inaccuracies, feels period appropriate. The other, whilst having some similarities, is portrayed more like something I would see in Game of Thrones. Quite literally, since I swear this is basically that execution scene in the first episode of season one, but they replace the Starks with the Tudors. Now, some people will say, ah, but this is historical fiction, so it doesn't need to be authentic. To which I will reply with a firm and resolute no. How is it meant to be historical fiction when I am struggling to connect the time period and characters of this series to their real-life counterparts? 
A proper historical based fantasy would be one in which I can at least tell what it is supposed to be, even if they are fictional and altered characters and locations. A bit like some of those animes I go on about like Saga of Tanny the Evil, Princess Principle, and one called Azetta the Last Witch, which I've been watching recently. Looking at it purely from the point of view of the historical eras they're meant to be representing, or at the very least referencing, I can tell just from looking at them that they are actually bothered to research things like what people were wearing, their buildings and so on. So for example, this one is clearly inspired by World War I, this one by the Victorian era, this one by World War II and so on. We have all grown up reading about the time periods and seeing various films so at a glance we can tell what they look like, even if we are lacking a PhD in history. I could find things to criticise with those shows, of course, but I could at least doff my hat to them in salute and acknowledge that they tried to represent a real-life time period but gave it a different twist. Hell, the Azetta one has a made-up country and gave it an anthem that honestly sounds like something that could feasibly be the anthem of a real-life country. The White Princess, meanwhile, pretends that it is a real-life country, but it fails to show what it was like, so I have no desire to connect with it. Now in this section, I may be repeating myself a bit since I have covered things like the characters and so on in the other parts. However, I will try in this section to leave the history to one side as much as possible and look at it from the point of view of it being a drama. This will be difficult for me since I'm a historian first and foremost, and forays into analysis like this give me nightmarish flashbacks to my A-level English days, but I'll give it a try. As I have stated a few times already, this series really does feel like a bad knockoff of Game of Thrones. Quite literally since they got Michelle Fairley, who's Caitlin Stark, to play Margaret Beaufort. This Game of Thrones writing really becomes apparent when they go and add things like the royal family watching Stanley's execution. Hell, he even tells his son to watch it, just like in Game of Thrones. Look away. King of the Andals in the first Father one. will know if you do. You will never wear the crown if you cannot watch a traitor die. We have magic and curses, just like in Game of Thrones. Incest and weird sex scenes, just like in Game of Thrones. Now, yes, G.R.R. Martin did have this sort of time period in mind when he wrote his books, so of course you're going to get similarities. But I can't help but laugh that we have got Game of Thrones taking elements from the real-life Wars of the Roses, an early Tudor period, and now we've gone full circle with the White Princess taking elements from Game of Thrones and adapting into a Tudor drama, producing some sort of weird incestuous love child. The thing with Martin, though, is that he was not writing a historical novel, so he had the freedom to do what he wanted with these historical elements, and can also, you know, write something interesting. What these writers have done is take the names of real people and try to do the same thing, but it just doesn't work since they cannot write decent or compelling characters. All the female characters, bar Margaret Pohl, are set to bitch mode throughout the entire thing. Seriously, they just fight and argue in order to make drama, which just makes them horrible and unrelatable. Except for Maggie Pole and maybe Jasper, I didn't find a single character likeable. The motivations are all over the damn place as well. The most jarring one for me has to be Elizabeth of York, who seems to be the least bitchy compared to some of the others, and is actually quite friendly with Margaret Pole, but around about episode 7 she just suddenly has a complete personality shift and goes full on Margaret Beaufort. I can't tell whether she's really supporting the Yorkists or the Tudor factions, since she seems to be doing both at once. I know they were trying to make it look like she was supporting the Yorkists at first whilst failing support for her husband in order to gain power, but then shifts over time, particularly after the birth of her son. But it was just not done well, particularly with the time jump between episode 4 and 5. I suppose she is meant to be confused herself, but in the end the person left most confused by all this was me, the viewer. It's not just the major characters' motivations that are all over the place. As I mentioned earlier with Lincoln, you quite often get no backstory or reason for people changing sides. He just out of nowhere draws his sword and says down with Henry. Sir William Stanley, who up until that point has been portrayed as a fairly loyal member of the King's Council, openly slangs him off when he's found out and goes all bitchy about it. Where is the backstory? Why did he not give us some reasons for why he would do this and betray the King he helped put on the throne? I would rather watch an episode about Sir William Stanley, the man who effectively won Bosworth for Henry, looking at why he turned on his King. The Shadow of the Tower did an episode on that, and whilst there are errors in the history, it shows Stanley as something of a powerful and scheming man which, whilst we will never know the truth, does at least explain why he would do what he did. Instead his portrayal comes out of nowhere, leaving our expectations subverted. But there is no build up to this since he has barely been in the series, so we get no payoff from it. I'm going to make a weird comparison here, but the anime Overlord does the whole character thing way better. Honestly, nearly every character that has lines has at least something that marks them as a character, even if they're only on screen for a matter of minutes. For example, early on in the series, a group of soldiers attack a village but end up having to face an undead monster. 
The captain of the guard starts screaming for his men to take it down for him, offering them money if they save his life, whilst his second in command chastises him and actually rallies the men. Both characters are killed within the next few minutes. We only get one of their names, but in that short time with limited dialogue, they are able to establish that one is a rather cowardly incompetent and the other a fairly brave and competent soldier. It gets even better when they stay with the character for longer so they get more of their backstory. And you know what you get in that series? A wide variety of characters with different backgrounds. Some are pretty much pure evil, others are very noble, others are opportunistic, and it could be argued some are all of these things and more depending on the situation. What do we get in the White Princess meanwhile? Well, nearly all the characters have angst mode on, many of them come across as pretty evil and likeable with no other character traits, a few occasionally feign a bit of sympathy when needed, and you get perhaps one or two characters that are somewhat noble in their intentions. I feel nothing for the characters in The White Princess since they are all so generic and really lack backstory, motivation and, you know, character. In the Overlord anime, I could tell that somebody like Ainz is motivated by the desire to protect his home and his servants, who are all he has left of his old friends. Arche is motivated by a desire to save her sisters from poverty, and so on. And the latter is all pretty much revealed in only a few lines of dialogue. If the White Princess had made that distinction, had Elizabeth of York as a noble and kind, family-orientated person, Henry VII as a Machiavellian schemer trying to secure his throne, Margaret Beaufort as a pious woman wanting to support her son, and so on, we could have had so much more, and I perhaps could have forgiven some of the authenticity errors. Instead, we have Margaret Beaufort being evil because... reasons. Elizabeth of York flip-flopping around from schemer to saint and back and forth again, depending on the plot and a weak King Henry trying to act important and cunning, but failing in having to fall back on his mother and his wife. Honestly though, at this point we might as well just let the Japanese write all of our dramas for us. I've already mentioned this, and I'm sorry for hammering the point home again, but logically, the whole bit with Henry going off to Spain does not make sense from a practical point. In fact, let us say that this plotline of Henry going off personally to secure the Spanish marriage was transported to the world of Westeros. If we go something like this, Tywin Lannister is told in the council that Stannis is preparing to attack King's Landing. So he goes, I know, I'll marry off Cersei to some nobleman across the sea somewhere to stop Daenerys. I can't leave this to ambassadors, so I'll go myself. He then goes off with Cersei, despite the fact that he knows Stannis is actively mobilising to attack King's Landing. Mars also sending off Tyrion off on a mission to collect taxes or some other menial rubbish. He then gets there, but the nobleman won't agree to it to the Union until they have Sansa beheaded or something. So he trolls off back just in time to see Stannis attack King's Landing. He then tries to rally his loyal noblemen, but they won't back him because the lord in some distant land they have not been allied to up until this point hasn't signed a treaty with them. So in the end, it is all up to Cersei to rally the troops and save the day, making Tywin look like an incompetent idiot. Now imagine if that was an actual episode of Game of Thrones. People would be rightly annoyed about how a cunning, powerful and astute lord could have done something so monumentally stupid and all he had to do was go and send some ambassadors in his place and stay behind to fight off his enemies. I hope that goes some of the way to explain how I feel about how that particular plotline in The White Princess just doesn't make sense and how it ruined the character of one of the most cunning and efficient kings England ever had. We also get other simple inconsistencies like, for example, spying and plotting. Elizabeth Woodville is writing letters to Lovell, but openly puts his name on the front. If you're meant to be doing it secretly, why are you putting his name on the front? Yes, there is one episode where she does it deliberately to throw people off. But outside of that example, she does it when she is not sending them secretly. Couldn't you be using code like how Mary Queen of Scots did? Or hell, how about using lemon juice as invisible ink? Whilst both examples of that are a bit in the future, I could have at least said, well, it has some precedent and makes sense for you trying to be sneaky. It is a sad time really when I am struggling to find any decent Tudor related dramas to watch since, save for Wolf Hall, they are all pretty much terrible. I mean we've gotten to the point now that I'd rather watch an anime about high school girls driving tanks, and an anime about high school girls spying around steampunk London, and an anime about a guy stuck as a skeleton wizard in a fantasy world, in which two of my favourite characters are high school age girls and... 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 and I, I'm, I'm going to prison, aren't I? Also, a quick point about continuity. Whilst I should really be sticking to this series only, it is a direct sequel to The White Queen, and, as you may know, I have seen one small part of that series. And I can't help but notice that in that series, King Richard III dies pretty much how he did historically. Yet in this one, they claim that he was buried alive. <sighs> Crikey, this one makes the Blackadder version of his death look accurate. Oi, that's my horse! <laughs> oh dear, Richard III. <laughs>
Now, if I were watching the White Queen and then the White Princess, I would be rather baffled since it appears you cannot even get your own continuity right. Hell, this passes on over onto the Spanish Princess as well. Margaret Pole's husband in The White Princess has a damaged hand and appears to be missing a few fingers that he lost at Bosworth. In The Spanish Princess, though, he is fine. He got over that whole injury thing in no time. How on earth did he manage to mess up on basic continuity like that, seeing as though the writing team for all three series hasn't really changed that much? I also find it a bit annoying that they recast everyone from series to series, claiming that they would not want to return since they would not want to be in a starring role. Well, Caroline Goodall, who plays Cecily of York, was in The White Queen and White Princess, so you saw fit to keep that the same. But sorry, no, I don't buy that at all. Actors do what they want, given the chance, and whilst many do want to move on to other projects, others will be more than happy to take a back seat, as long as they can portray a character they know and love. I mean, Elizabeth R. got some of the cast back from the Six Wives series, like Bernard Hepton, and a few others to reply to their historical roles, in order to keep continuity, even though they were only in the first episode briefly. I don't buy the age argument either, since this is only a period of 15 years. They haven't all aged up dramatically. Hell, I would have preferred to have seen the actors who played Henry and Elizabeth in The White Princess, as opposed to the ones in Spanish Princess, who are way too old given that it's only been two years since the end of The White Princess. Now I'll quickly add a final part about things I thought The White Princess actually did alright. I was going to make this into its own separate section, but there is not enough to justify that. The actors were actually better than the ones in The Spanish Princess overall, although I did prefer Harriet Walters' performance, but Michelle Fairley was still good, considering how bad the writing is. Jodie Comer is actually a decent actress, and can deliver a performance. I may have moaned about that whole bit with her convincing the nobleman to support Henry, but in terms of acting she was pretty spot on, and actually, dare I say, that was probably her best part in the series. If she had been playing a fictional queen in a fictional medieval setting, then I would have had no problem with it. But since it is applied to a historical time period and a historical character who would not have said it, then I do have a problem. I have to say as well that Rebecca Benson as Margaret Pole was a pretty decent choice, and Laura Carmichael, who plays the character in the success of Spanish Princess series, does resemble her a bit, so good casting on that one. In terms of plot lines, the Edward Earl of Warwick parts were the closest the series came to portraying the history right, and actually made me feel sympathy for a character at last. Whilst they did get some details wrong, like the fact that historically he was imprisoned almost immediately after Bosworth, whereas in this series he's still at liberty for a while, they do get it right in that he was imprisoned as a boy, spent the rest of his life in the tower, and was beheaded on trumped up charges of treason in order for the Spanish marriage to go ahead, or so it is believed. Some details are wrong, for example, he was actually put on trial and accused of plotting to escape with Warbeck, whereas here they make him sign his name on a bit of blank paper, which they then fill out with a fake confession later on. But compared to everything else, it's somewhat tried. Now Warwick being portrayed as though he had some sort of mental disorder is at least based off of a source. The chronicler Edward Hall wrote that, Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick, of whom you have heard before, being kept in the tower almost from his tender age, that is to say, from his first year of the king to this fifteenth year, out of all company of men and sight of beasts, insomuch that he could not discern a goose from a cap on. The mention that he was kept locked up and could not tell animals apart has led to suggestions that he may have had some sort of mental issue. However, Hall was writing, firstly, half a century later, and, secondly, he may have meant that he simply wasn't very well educated, which is personally how I interpret it, seeing as though he was well enough to stand trial, and there were laws in place that prevented the execution of people who had been declared insane. Well, at least up until Henry VIII changed that so he could execute Lady Jane Rochford, but that was over 40 years in the future. The point about Warwick, though, is open to debate, so I don't mind it too much. Obviously, there are other inaccuracies, like him being executed inside the tower, whereas he was actually executed on Tower Hill, but compared to the other stuff, I can somewhat forgive this. You also did get a few little mentions of things in there that I appreciated, including Henry backdating his reign to just before Bosworth, which was yet again another great move by him, since it meant that everyone who fought against him at Bosworth was therefore a traitor. Honestly, if we had more of that and a Machiavellian Henry, then I would have been much nicer in my criticism. I hope you managed to endure this look at the White Princess, or, as it is also called, Tudor Love Island, and will sympathise with my view that it is a terrible production in terms of accuracy, authenticity, and can't even stand on its own as a drama, regardless of the history. It amazes me to think that the people responsible for this series, whether it be Philippa Gregory who wrote the books, or the writers who adapted it, thought that these changes from the history would be good. 
I can accept some changes if there is a good purpose to them. What I cannot accept is ignoring the history and replacing it with rubbish when, if they just kept close to the source material, they would probably have had a far more compelling and interesting show that would have been equally, if not even more successful. As I often say at the end of these rants, the rot has set in, and we are doomed to endure more poorly written dramas like this for years to come, I am afraid. Well, at least I can be confident in the fact that this particular line of dramas is over, and that the Spanish princess will not be getting a second season- OH MY GOODNESS! Ugh, oh, well, may maybe it won't be out for a while- uh, oh, no. Oh, oh, dear. Well, I guess the Cheetah Rant series will have to march on then. I think I deserve a bit of a break from Philip Gregory's works, so the next one will probably be looking at the 2003 Henry VIII film. Although my priority right now is to get Waterloo Part 2 done. In the meantime, thank you for listening. This has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day. By the way, I'm going to make this prediction about the Spanish princess right now. They're going to add a scene where Catherine will be at Flodden, with her doing a Zena like her mother. Except this time on the Scots, possibly even having Margaret on the other side. Will I be right in my prediction? Well, we will find out soon.